going into um, uh, sort of a cave right now. Um, uh, just, I just thought I would share some uh, recent research uh, that uh, I've been working on, uh, a couple of studies that I've planned, uh, and I think especially I hope to rely on the shared expertise of this group for feedback and comments, uh, because the two planned studies in particular um, uh, are um, I'm actually working on the uh, ethics applications for both of them right now. So um, I would be very interested in, in your feedback um, and insights. Uh, I'm, at, I'm still at a stage where I can make changes to the procedure. Um, all right, so let's see if we can get this going. Um, so as, I say, as I'm saying over here, there's two completed studies that I'd like to, to describe first, uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of research that um, I'm involved in. Um, the first uh, is a, uh, an efficacy study. Um, and the word efficacy, of course, uh, usually comes loaded with a whole uh, set of baggage in terms of what do we mean by this. Um, but this follows very much in the tradition of the research by the Open Education Group at Brigham Young University uh, that I'm assuming your group is aware of. Um, uh, the difference for, for me was uh, a lot of that research, uh, almost all of that research, uh, has taken place in the United States. So questions about whether uh, the use of an open educational resource or, or an open textbook um, will uh, at the very least do no harm, but also perhaps uh, carry any benefit in terms of learning outcomes to students have all been, I think in my mind, addressed in that context, in the US context. Uh, and by that, I mean high tuition, uh, which gives you a relatively low proportion uh, of um, course materials cost to tuition. In the Canadian context, uh, this would be the first efficacy study that I'm aware of, uh, where tuition is significantly lower. Um, so course materials at my institution, for example, are in the range of 40% of tuition for context. So this study was done with, in collaboration with a few of my colleagues in the psychology department. Um, I should note that uh, although I um, uh, designed and, and, and conducted the study, uh, my I did not run the study in my own classes. Um, being deeply invested in this uh, movement, uh, I wanted to create a firewall over there. So the Farhad Dastur, Richard Legrand, Kurt Penna are all instructors who I recruited for this project. Uh, they have very, they had varying levels of interest, uh, awareness, um, uh, and enthusiasm about OER, but they were willing to come on board on this project. Um, and so this study uh, essentially asked the question of um, uh, what is the impact on course performance, but also things like study habits, uh, perceptions and experiences when students use um, commercial textbooks uh, versus open textbooks. But uh, another aspect of this uh, study was that we were trying to disentangle a bit um, uh, the usual conflation of open textbooks uh, with digital textbooks. Uh, of course, we all know that um, uh, 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 open textbooks are very often perhaps primarily used in digital formats, but they are available in print format as well. Uh, and of course, the, the opposite is true as well for uh, commercial textbooks where they are available in digital, but uh, for the most part, they're used in, in print format. Um, so in trying to disentangle this, we ended up with uh, three conditions in this particular study. Uh, this is a study run in introductory psychology classes. Um, those of you who attended open ed in November in Vancouver, I apologize, you would have seen some of these data already. Um, so a few sections uh, were assigned to the um, open textbook commercial, te uh, oh, sorry, the uh, open textbook by OpenStax. Um, half of those sections were assigned to the digital version of the Open ta OpenStax textbook, uh, with the students having the option to download and print by themselves if they liked. Um, the other half of the Open Textbook sections were assigned to the print condition, where we provided a uh, we had sponsorship funding available to provide them with free uh, print copies of the Open Textbook. Now, this is an awkward situation because this is not naturalistic. Uh, students who normally would be using a print copy of the open textbook um, would obviously have to pay for it, even though it's a, a significantly reduced cost from a traditional uh, commercial publisher's textbook. But over here, we wanted to uh, exercise some experimental control, uh, hold the cost variable constant at zero for the open textbook conditions, so that within the open textbook uh, conditions, we could um, look purely at format while holding uh, the cost factor constant. So this is a deliberate uh, perversion of a naturalistic context, I suppose. Um, on the other hand, we have um, um, uh, the commercial textbook, which was a uh, the incumbent book in its 10th edition um, by, by Worth Publishers, 
And over here, uh, we made the reverse choice, uh, which is we allowed it to be a naturalistic control uh, where students would normally take the classes, they would normally purchase the book, some of them might buy the digital copy, some of them might not buy the book at all. Um, and so we wanted the control group, as it were, to be a, a naturalistic control. And so we did not impose any restrictions on the format or cost uh, or, uh, or the access to the commercial textbook in those sections. Um, and we can talk about that later, but these are, I think, examples of some of those uh, subtle subjective decisions that are made along the way of this supposedly quantitative objective research. Um, but of course, we're trying to triangulate each time, uh, trying to address small questions iteratively. So moving on over here, just note that there are several sections uh, in uh, of classes in each of these conditions um, with uh, uh, all three of my colleagues teaching uh, the collective, I think it was nine sections in all. Uh, oh, never mind. Sorry. Um, seven sections. Um, so you can see the layout over here. We have fairly small classes at my institution, um, uh, which is why you're seeing fairly small uh, ends in, in, in within the conditions. Nonetheless, this is the context that we work within. Um, so two sections open digital, two sections open print. Uh, all of those were done in the spring. Uh, of 2015 and then three sections in the summer of 2015 um, with the uh, commercial textbook. Um, we did of course measure a whole host of demographic characteristics, uh, other variables concerning students' um, educational status, uh, how far they progressed to get a sense of group equivalency. Uh, this is, of course, uh, quasi-experimental research. We're not randomly assigning students to different textbooks uh, because that would be very difficult to do uh, with students um, paying different levels of money in the same section that would have created a riot. Um, so, of course, uh, quasi-experimental. So we're trying to gauge equivalency by measuring these things. Uh, and as you can see, there's there's for the most part, no differences, but there are two key differences over here. Uh, so students um, taking the uh, courses which had been assigned the commercial textbook had completed um, uh, more courses at that point, so they're more, more advanced in terms of their degree completion, um, as well as they were taking fewer courses concurrently. Um, now, of course, both of those, in a sense, set things up um, so that the commercial students have a bit of an advantage, uh, being more uh, advanced in that sense, but also uh, having less on their plate. Uh, this may largely be a function, I suspect, of it being the summer semester for the commercial textbook students. Uh, and, and I think so I think it's just an artifact of that. Nonetheless, when it comes to interpretation of the results, you should keep those two uh, issues in mind. Um, we also, at the start of the semester, assessed uh, students' general knowledge of psychology. Uh, so this is what was being tested in terms of the course exam. So we thought we'd start with a bit of a baseline. Um, and as you can see over here, um, there was there were no significant differences across the three conditions. And I'm collapsing across instructors over here um, uh, in terms of their existing knowledge. So uh, across most of the demographic variables um, and uh, general knowledge, there was no difference to begin with. Um, but of course, the big punchline has to do with exam performance. And I should note that the three instructors coordinated their course design so that they each had three course exams, non-cumulative content. Um, and they coordinated those so that uh, the multiple choice questions on each of those three exams for th each of those three instructors across all of the seven sections were identical. And that allowed us to, to gauge the, the, um, the difference across the conditions. Um, and when you look at the data combined um, uh, with a multiple analysis of variance uh, across the different instructors, what stands out is that the impact of instructor is far, far larger than any other variable in the mix. And so for that reason, we, we uh, needed to look at the data separately as well uh, within instructor, if you will. And so I'm going to show you some representative data from one of the instructors who happened to teach uh, sections across all three conditions. So this is uh, Richard Legrand's uh, students. Uh, as you can see, exam one, exam two, exam three. Um, and for the most part, you see non-significant differences uh, in terms of exam performance on exam two, exam three. But during the first exam for Richard's uh, students, um, students assigned the commercial textbook performed significantly uh, worse, significantly more poorly um, than those assigned either uh, format of the open textbook. Um, notably, the particular format of the open textbook didn't appear to make any difference whatsoever. Um, and that's useful, uh, as you'll see moving ahead. 
but we were interested in much more than just exam performance and part of this is i wanted to get a sense of the the potential mediating variables for example is it that students interact with these different formats and different kinds of textbooks differently and is that what uh, um, that is that what predicts the difference in performance um, at all but and we'll get to that next but uh, just to be clear uh, at this point uh, these kinds of data these kinds of results are very very consistent with the other uh, 12 published studies that have looked at efficacy within the United States uh, where they've either found no difference or uh, an improved performance uh, for students with the open textbooks. Um, the other thing to mention over here is the issue of timing. Um, why do we think that students uh, perform better uh, with the open textbooks on the first exam? Uh, again, this is educated guessing, but a post-talk explanation for me would be access. Uh, it is very often the case in our educational context that students wait several weeks to decide whether they want to or need to purchase a course textbook. And it's likely that that decision was made um, uh, around the time of the first exam for those students in the commercial textbook. Uh, again, that's a post-talk explanation. Um, so what about study habits? Um, here are some of the other differences that showed up, but keep in mind these are not pre-existing differences like courses completed or concurrent courses registered in. Um, this is during, during the semester. Um, so we found that students using the commercial textbook uh, spend more time or at least reported spending more time per week studying for the course. And that's curious because when you put all of that together, um, they're more advanced students, they're taking fewer courses at the same time, and they're spending more time studying per week and they're still doing just the same or perhaps worse. Uh, that's really, it's it sort of, you've raised the stakes at that point and you've still uh, won the roll of the dice. Um, how much of your weekly assignments do you typically complete? Uh, this was, um, these are data that I think are, are, are informative. They sort of um, provide some roundabout evidence of what might be going on. Uh, because even though the students with the commercial textbook spend more time studying, they're completing the same amount of readings. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I'll leave you to, uh, with your own impression about what a 30% um, uh, reading completion rate uh, looks like uh, or, or means. But more than this, um, we also wanted to dig into um, how does this break up? So is it that students are spending more time studying, uh, reading the textbook or the lecture notes, for example? And we found it was in the lecture notes. So um, even though students with the commercial textbook spent more time studying per week, uh, they did not spend more time uh, reading the textbook. They did spend more time, significantly more time than students with the print format of the open textbook um, reviewing lecture material. So that's a curious thing. So I think that's where that additional time spent studying comes from, is the reviewing of lecture material for those with the commercial textbook. And that in itself is interesting uh, because that suggests that perhaps uh, they felt it was easier to review the lecture material or they were more naturally drawn to the lecture material or their lecture notes in the commercial textbook section than the book itself. Why might that be the case? Well, I think we'll answer that very, very shortly. But before we do that, just one more slide over here. At the end of the semester, having experienced the particular format and, um, and uh, nature, I suppose, of the textbook that they did, uh, we did want to ask them what they would have preferred um, if cost were not a factor at the end of the semester, having used the book for four months. Um, and there were really no differences uh, across the conditions in terms of their preferences, significant differences, that is. Um, but there was uh, certainly a, a, a general trend favoring uh, print textbooks. And this is not different from what we typically find. When you ask students what they would prefer, they generally do uh, report that they would all like print textbooks. Um, of course, there is a non-significant trend over here for students assigned the digital copy of the open textbook um, uh, to be slightly less likely to prefer the print textbook. So that may be the weight of experience over there. But to come back to the question of why might students uh, with the commercial textbook spend more time uh, reviewing lecture material and less time studying the textbook, uh, well, this might be why. Uh, when we asked them about their perceptions of the textbooks themselves, we used a uh, validated instrument called the Textbook Assessment and Usage Scale, the TAUS. It's been published uh, in 2011, I think, um, uh, by Regan Gurung and his colleagues uh, in the journal Teaching of Psychology. Um, useful instrument. Nice to have a validated one, um, 16 different dimensions. You're seeing uh, obviously seven of them over here, uh, the seven that showed a difference across the conditions. Uh, and when I say that all differences are significant, whoopsie, uh, when I say that all, all um, 
differences are significant at p uh, less than 0.05 i'm talking specifically about uh, the commercial textbooks uh, uh, which are uh, which appear in red uh, versus the open print uh, which appears in green the open digital uh, is not significantly different from either of them but across the board on every single dimension out of those 16 where a difference uh, occurred or, or showed up it favored the print format of the open textbook uh, incredible. Um, so, and these are substantive aspects of the textbook, right? You think about the, the writing being clear, engaging the research examples, everyday examples, uh, and the study aids to students as well. These are not the typical things that we think of, because I think the impression of open textbooks uh, versus commercial textbooks is that uh, the commercial books are much more glossy and, and shiny and have that razzle dazzle uh, in some cases. Uh, but over here, the things that that appeared uh, that the students appeared to point to uh, as as key differences were not superficial things these are substantive differences uh, and in fact when you look at the um, uh, more superficial things like the figures and the illustrations and the glossy photographs those are the dimensions on which there were no differences reported by the students so these are their perceptions these are between groups differences but still they're using uh, the same scale over here it's a validated scale um, so I'm really quite um, pleased to see this result uh, these are the uh, others uh, these are seven there are two other dimensions that are also in this mix that also showed no difference, um, but I ran out of room in this slide. So, <laughs> but basically um, uh, there's only seven out of the 16 that showed a difference. Every other one showed no difference. And every time there was a difference, it favored the print format of the open textbook. So quite incredible. Um, one last slide over here. And this, you know, uh, aligns nicely with the uh, dimensions that you just saw. Uh, how would you rate the overall sort of holistic global quality of the textbook? Again, showing up that students prefer the print format of the open textbook uh, significantly more so than the um, um, uh, uh, commercial textbook. And I'm, I'm stopping myself from saying the print format, even though about 80% of our commercial textbook students reported purchasing a print format, um, uh, about 18% reported buying a digital textbook. Um, um, so just for context. Um, and then uh, there's this last question, and this is a question simply because I'm a psychologist and usually when I go to talk to other psychologists about it, uh, you get this very annoying question which you only get from psychologists, which is the question having to do with cognitive dissonance. And surely students won't value uh, the book if they receive it for free. So I said, fine, let's throw in this question. Um, you know, regardless of how much you paid for the book, uh, what do you think would be a fair price? What would you be happy paying? What do you think is fair value? Uh, keep in mind that the commercial textbook students at this point have spent over $100 uh, Canadian on their textbook. And this is the cheapest possible version of the textbook. So again, it's not that we're purposely trying to exaggerate differences between the groups that favor our hypothesis. Um, they had the option from the bookstore. The first option, uh, the only option from the bookstore actually, is for them to buy a loose leaf binder version. So it's not a hard cover bound fancy thing. Um, that's the cheapest possible print, and that costs over $100. Uh, but the fascinating thing over here is, as you can see, there's really no difference in terms of how much they value the books or what value they place on the books, uh, even whether they paid over $100 or whether they paid $0. So the question of, you know, will they value it adequately um, if they receive it for free? Um, yes. Um, all right. Um, so I think. Uh, uh, you might be familiar at this point with uh, David Wiley's um, mad, glad, sad, rad rubric. Uh, I do like this. Um, so on the on the y-axis, you're seeing cost to students. And at this point, it should probably be $400 on the y-axis and not the $200 at the top, but still. Um, how much do students spend for their resources? And on the x-axis, what, what is their performance? In this case, what is, uh, the, what is the proportion of students completing the course with a C or better? The two grayed out sections are sad and glad because, I mean, they're, they're interesting, but they're not really surprising. If you don't, let's say, buy your resources, if you don't spend any money and you don't purchase your course materials uh, and you do badly, that's sad, but not surprising. Uh, if you spend the money, you buy your course resources and you do better, and you do well, let's say. Uh, again, you're glad, but not surprising. Uh, but what we're starting to find more and more uh, is that we're looking at a contrast between students who are spending a lot of money uh, and doing either just the same or perhaps better. Uh, and when you're doing worse with a commercial textbook after spending many, uh, after spending uh, a lot of money, uh, that of course can make you mad versus the situation that we have with OER across the 13 odd studies now, if you include this one, uh, which is rather rad. So it's catchy, it's easy, but uh, it's a rubric that I think is easy to apply here. 
So again, um, quick summary of this, uh, of the of the results of this work, and this was the bigger one. I'm going to be much quicker for the rest. I promise. Um, um, really, textbook format did not uh, did not appear to impact course performance, but uh, much as uh, with the other studies, uh, students using the open textbook perform the same as or better than. So I think at this point we need to move away from the question of um, are we doing any harm to students, uh, because of course um, with the MADSAD. Um, uh, etc. rubric, uh, one could argue that if students are performing even the same as those with an open textbook, um, uh, with a commercial textbook that is, um, uh, the cost itself of the commercial textbook is actually doing harm if there's no difference in course performance. Uh, and I think wrapped up in all of this are our own um, uh, fantastical delusions as instructors about uh, how many of our students actually um, uh, obtain a copy of the course textbook, how many of them having obtained a copy are actually bothering to read it at all. And I think once you strip away those delusions, the, it makes a shockingly little difference. And so I think the questions we need to now ask are, are much more sophisticated. Uh, things like, for example, is it the case that the better prepared uh, higher achieving students uh, coming into the class is it the case that for them it makes little or no difference uh, what materials you put in front of them uh, and is it that this issue of open textbooks and the access which is I think the key variable over here um, is it that the access to the uh, to the resources for free and immediately and permanently does that boost the performance of less prepared lower performing uh, students uh, and I think that's a, a better question to be asking at this point um, no, the instructors did not uh, adopt the open textbook in any real way other than uh, teach introductory psychology in two halves, um, Jenny. And so uh, the book was simply split into two and this was used for only one half of it. But no, this was not an adaptation. So we're not looking at the um, at, at uh, any, the impact of, of any of the higher permissions uh, of the five R's. Um, all right. So from here, I'm going to move to a much, much quicker study. Uh, this was an online survey ran over the last year uh, with um, uh, post-secondary uh, students in British Columbia, where I live. Uh, this was across all institutions, or not all, really, sort of half of the institutions, uh, uh, about 12 institutions. And we were trying to reach out to students who were enrolled in courses that were adopting an open textbook uh, across disciplines. So we're talking about a real uh, mix over here of disciplines and specific open textbooks, just trying to get a sense of their perceptions and their experiences. Uh, and uh, just quickly, so you have a sense of who was in this, uh, just over 300 students completed this uh, over the course of that term. Um, and uh, you know this was uh, sampling through the faculty adopters. So BC Campus is the organization that runs, uh, administers the BC Open Textbook Project. I simply uh, sent out a recruitment email through BC Campus to the uh, instructors that they knew that had reported they were adopting open textbooks. And those instructors in turn filtered those invitations uh, to take part in the survey to their students. Um, as you can see, it's skewing towards a, a, a female sample, a majority female sample. And EFL over here is English as a first language. And this is interesting, isn't it? For 52% of the reporting sample to not have English as a first language. Uh, and I think this is interesting for me uh, because this resembles my particular educational context at my institution um, uh, where it's, it's quite a bit different from the larger research universities where that proportion would be a lot higher for English as a first language. Uh, but I think I, I'm happy with this because this to me uh, uh, speaks more closely to the to the real potential impact and, and mandate of um, improved access. Nonetheless, um, one question that I had looking in my mind as well was was how much do students um, work? Um, we all have an anecdotal sense that our students are working more and more. Um, and as you can see over here, we have uh, a good proportion of the sample working more than um, um, uh, 15 hours a week. Um, so uh, somewhere about 40% of the sample uh, is uh, working, or just over 40%, is working for more than 15 hours a week. Um, and uh, I note this because when you think about the amount uh, that textbooks cost, students are asked to budget for, for example, $1,000 to $1,200 uh, an academic year. Um, we're talking about uh, about a month and a half or two months worth of salary for the uh, for the median student over here. And so again, I just wanted to put that into context. Um, I'm just trying to respond over here to, to Lisa's question um, online easier for students to access online dictionaries. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean about that. If you're talking about the previous study and the uh, students using the digital textbook or, or this particular survey. Um, 
so perhaps uh, let me know and then I can, uh, can respond to that more. Um, okay. So this is an interesting thing because they asked, they asked a budget between $1,000 and $1,200 a year for textbooks, but we asked them what they actually spent uh, over the last 12 months. And on average, it's about $702, um, which is uh, certainly several textbooks short of a full uh, suite. Um, it's interesting also, as you've seen the increase in textbook prices over the last uh, several decades, I think it's something like 82% over the last uh, 10 years specifically in North America. Um, but textbook sales at bookstores have been shrinking and shrinking, which is why they're now called campus stores, because there are fewer textbooks sold over there than, than, than merchandise. Um, and so you see that over here, uh, the proportion of students who reported buying a new, brand new textbook at the bookstore, university bookstore, is fairly small, less than 20%. Um, you see a lot of them buying the textbooks off campus. Uh, this is in print format. Um, a lot of them reselling the textbooks at the end of the semester. Um, if they do buy it at the bookstore, they're far, far more likely to buy it uh, in used format, for example. Here's another interesting finding. The proportion of students um, who reported downloading, attempting to download an illegal copy or pirated copy of the textbook, um, fairly high. And I think this is a, a testament to the to the crunch that the system puts them in, that they think that this is a preferable option, um, you know, uh, putting themselves at risk for pro pro prosecution. Uh, shared purchases, so groups of students buying the textbook, uh, again, about 25% of them doing that. Uh, certainly suboptimal when you've got to study the book at the same time for the same course for the same exam. Um, Ebooks, they're not uh, a modal option, certainly, but they're there. People are turning to them when they can. And then more and more savvy students are realizing that you can actually use library reserve copies or sometimes interlibrary loans. So uh, I think the fact that this particular uh, bar is so uh, um, overshadowed by the rest of them uh, is a reflection of, of uh, how we what we think our students are doing versus what they're actually doing. It's like one of those internet memes, really. Um, so moving on from there, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we 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 asked them some of the questions from the famous uh, 2012, I think, Florida student textbook survey. Uh, in terms of uh, what is the impact of high textbook costs on your educational choices over here? Um, has the high cost of textbooks influenced you in terms of taking fewer courses, not registering for a particular course, dropping or withdrawing for a course, uh, earning a poor grade in a course, or simply not purchasing a, a textbook at all for a particular course? Um, and over here, as you can see, in general, a majority of the sample reports um, that it is, oh, it looks like the legend is missing, isn't it? Uh, uh, not at all uh, the case that this is influencing them or strongly disagreeing with that anyway. Um, uh, and this is uh, one difference between the Canadian and, and, and uh, American context. In the American context, you see much higher numbers. Uh, but over here, uh, if you're asking, if you put the, if you put the threshold at, uh, have you done this for at least one of your courses, um, uh, sort of going from rarely to onwards um, to, 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 to very frequently, um, then you start to see that it's somewhere in the region of 30%. Uh, but if you're looking at um, how many students have not purchased their course textbook for at least one of their courses, it's over 50% of the students. Now, how many of them are doing so uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, and more? That's about 40%. Um, um, uh, frequently and, and very often or, or regularly um, is, is uh, about 15%. And, but you've got almost 10% who um, absolutely routinely, they do not buy their textbooks. So again, um, this paints, I think, a bit of a picture to try and fill in the background of when we talk about um, the cost savings to students and the impact of that on their educational choices. Uh, we've seen data from the US uh, that's looked at, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, course completion rates, uh, program completion rates, student retention rates, and we're trying to get a sense of the impact of that uh, over here as well. So there is an impact, it's, it's muted because it's not as severe as it might be in the Canadian context, at least tuition certainly isn't, or in the US context. Um, so these were all students, of course, who were using open textbooks. We, so we did ask them how they access their open textbooks. Uh, and for the most part, it's online or the PDFs. PDFs were most uh, popular. Uh, and I think it's a curious thing um, because there were a, a few qualitative open-ended questions that we asked them again. Um, and and it, it's fascinating to me how often uh, these, um, you know, otherwise uh, 
intelligent, um, uh, critical thinking, reasonable educators uh, will often use the term digital natives to describe contemporary students. It's infuriating to me uh, with the number of students who have no idea how to interact with a PDF document, even though that's the preferred format over here. They don't know that it has a table of contents. They don't know it has a search function. Uh, so I think even though we're dealing with this issue, uh, I think um, this in fact should tell us that we need to um, Instructors who adopt these open textbooks should uh, should be aware that their students are likely to access it in PDF format and they actually need to instruct them how to use those features. Um, uh, a minority of students, albeit a significant minority, reported printing their open textbooks. Um, we have a professional print on demand service in British Columbia for all of the institutions, but fewer than 10% of the, or less than 10% of the students reported using that professional service. Uh, another 10% reported printing it elsewhere, perhaps at a local print shop. Uh, and that's likely the case because uh, close to 80% of the students reported printing the chapters as needed, not all at once. And so uh, because of that, we see, I think, many more students printing at home because it's just a chapter as they need it, as opposed to the whole book. So they're trying to save money whatever they can. Um, and so it's not just the case that they're waiting with commercial textbooks to see if they need the book. Even when they're given a free book, they're waiting to see if they need to print it and as and when they actually need it. Uh, it's quite interesting. All right, a uh, couple of more things having to do with this study. Um, how important are the features of the open textbook to you? Um, and this is a fascinating one. Uh, cost savings, overwhelming, right? And this this is a low hanging fruit, um, but certainly if you get 86% um, or 87% of students saying it's either very important or absolutely essential, that's rather overwhelming. Um, now, of course, these are students who've experienced the glory of cost savings having to do with an open textbook, but the other features that they were interested in, uh, and again, I'm just, I'm not using uh, the average or little or no importance. I'm just looking at the uh, blue and green parts of those bars, which are import very important or absolutely essential. Um, and again, 86, 87 percent uh, uh, looking at um, uh, excuse me, uh, immediate access being important or essential. Um, uh, another sort of 70% uh, or so looking at convenience, portability across formats. Uh, less so for the option to print, the fact that they can retain it permanently, that they don't feel compelled to resell the books, and that they can share it with others um, in their family, their friends, and so on. Uh, so for at least from students' points of view, I, I think that's what they see as, as the real advantages having used them. And then, of course, you have to ask about um, uh, quality. Uh, the previous study uh, certainly looked at student perceptions of quality, uh, but this was now uh, across all books and across uh, all disciplines. Uh, would you have preferred a traditional textbook? Again, you're seeing about 65% saying they either slightly or strongly disagree with that. Uh, not preferring a, a traditional textbook. And if you throw in the neither for, for good measure, uh, then you're seeing practically 82% uh, of the students saying it makes no difference or I would prefer uh, an open textbook. And reflecting that quite well, how would you rate the quality of your open textbook? This, In this case, it's not just the introspect one of the previous study, it's a whole melange of study uh, of, uh, of uh, open textbooks. And you're seeing, again, above average 34%, excellent 43%, average 20%. I mean, good Lord, 97% saying it's the same or better. Um, overwhelming. And this is a real heterogeneous mix. So it's quite interesting to see it, it show up so, um, so strongly. So, those are the, the completed studies, um, which is almost everything I'm going to say. But uh, so some of the work, as you can see, has to do is trying to look at the question of, of efficacy, whatever that means, uh, in terms of effectiveness, impact on learning outcomes, impact on studying habits and course completion rates and things like that. The other has to do with their perceptions and experiences of using it uh, themselves um, beyond um, just uh, sort of this quasi experimental research. Uh, and of course, there's all of these studies have drawbacks, limitations, and so we're trying to very slowly triangulate and, and, and keep asking the right questions and keep asking slightly more sophisticated questions. Uh, yes, this was a different measure of quality to the TAUS scale. This was just a global rating. Um, uh, as an online survey across students with no incentive, um, uh, I was trying to keep the survey fairly short uh, to ensure a higher completion rate. So yeah, that's why again one of those decisions that that unfortunately does uh, make, affects the design of the study. Um, right. So on to the last couple of things. 
um, and this is not this is not the last couple of things actually, but I just wanted to point this out. Uh, Beck, who's who's here, uh, and I worked on this study together with a, a few of our colleagues, Christina Hendricks, Jesse Hendricks, Clint Lalonde at BC Campus, uh, and this was published what um, in January or February of this year, I think. Um, was it this year? Yeah. Um, and it's available at that URL, and I'm just pointing you to that because that study influenced what's coming next. Um, this was a, a survey of faculty uh, um, faculty in British Columbia who are um, aware of OER or perhaps even using OER in their courses. And I'm going to quickly, quickly, quickly show you three things. This is one of the slides that interested me from that report, which you can download. Uh, the reasons for not using open textbooks from the BC Open Textbook Project. So we were interested in the perceived barriers to, 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 to using open textbooks. And of course, you can see ranging from no textbook available for the discipline uh, to poor quality, at least a perceived poor quality, uh, only 17%, I suppose you could say. Uh, lack of time is usually a big issue. Ancillary resources, lack of support from colleagues, uh, especially if you're talking about a committee decision and not an individual decision, uh, and not aware, you know, what is OER? Um, this is one of the things that influenced the study to come. Uh, and when we looked at the most significant barriers, again, difficulty finding um, relevant and high quality OER and looking for OER, uh, this was a big, big barrier along with time to look. So these are some of the data that, that came out of that report. Um, and it's because of this and this last one as well, um, not just what were your barriers, but if you did adopt or are you, if you are adopting open textbooks right now, uh, what enabled that, uh, what factors in, uh, increased your likelihood of doing so, and it's sort of a, a mirror of the other one, I, I suppose, uh, that the resources were available, that they were relevant, that they were high quality, or at least people use things like uh, a reputable producer, I think, as a proxy for high quality sometimes when they don't take the time to look. It's like, oh, it's, it's my, 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 my um, you know, OpenStax or, or sometimes MIT, even though some of the MIT open courseware is, um, anyway, um, uh, Creative Commons license, uh, personal recommendations. Anyway, so partly because of this study, I wanted to dig a bit deeper. This was an online survey as well. Um, and uh, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Daniel Paradis, who some of you may know, has done uh, really cool um, qualitative research with um, faculty. She did these wonderful um, hour-long interviews, in-depth interviews, uh, revealing a bunch of themes. Uh, and so Daniel and I are, are collaborating on a study right now where we're doing um, briefer interviews with about 25 faculty across disciplines in, in BC uh, addressing these sorts of questions. And this is qualitative research, which is, which is Danny's background, uh, but she's an, a fabulous, fabulous researcher. She's an incredible mind. And so I just, this is me trying to find some way to collaborate with Danny. Um, and so we're going to be doing this study over the next little while. Uh, we're um, in the middle of the ethics process right now. Uh, but I wanted to just share some of the questions. And these are not really sort of interview questions that are very fixed. These are sort of guiding sort of themes that are going to guide uh, what's going to be, I think, a much more free flowing interview for those 15 minutes for, with each of those faculty. But we're really looking over here at faculty who have now adopted, getting a, a real um, closer sense of their, of their experience, trying to capture some of the things that the quantitative online survey research really can't do very well, and following up in particular on the themes having to do with uh, barriers and enabling factors and how those vary by type of institution. That's another question that, that the study that Beck and I worked on uh, tried to tackle a little bit, but over here we're going to try to do so much more intentionally. Uh, how different are these barriers at community colleges versus, versus four-year teaching universities uh, which don't have graduate programs and don't really focus on research versus research universities? Um, how does this play differently? Um, certainly, for example, I expect to see things like um, uh, at the research universities, uh, concerns about tenure, uh, pressures to do research, and so on, uh, and the um, uh, the um, the how do I how do I put this? The fact that that the creation of an adaptation of OER are not typically taken into account in the tenure and, and promotion process is a much more significant barrier there than it be at the other types of institutions. Community colleges, on the other hand, have a much bigger open access mandate. Um, they also, I suspect, will see a much more uh, a much greater impact in terms of um, course performance and completion rates because the issue of access is much greater over there. But trying to dig much deeper in terms of understanding what are the barriers in these different types of institutions and then using those um, um, open-ended qualitative data, using those themes to guide sort of action plans that, that, um, uh, that are tailored to the particular kind of institution, for example. Um, right, yes, thank you.
rich enough? That's a great point. Um, is it my sense that textbooks um, um, a key driver for faculty member adoption in this movement. It's an interesting thing. Uh, I think for some, I mean, the faculty are, so, uh, are wonderfully heterogeneous, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and for many of them, who, especially those who are not aware of what OER are, uh, they know what textbooks are. And so that's an easy entry point to the dis to the discussion, in my experience, because when you say oh, this is a, this is just a textbook, and you can give them a print copy, and it looks and smells and tastes like the textbook, uh, that's an easy. Um, uh, driver, as you say, uh, for adoption, just awareness raising, and then subsequently adoption. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, I also see a lot of people starting uh, uh, in BC, at least. Uh, the first way in which they dip their toe in OER uh, is through is as supplementary material, uh, whether it's videos or images or simulations or other online resources. And they start by not using it as a textbook, but by supplementing it. And once they learn that, oh, this is actually an open educational resource, uh, and then it can sort of move further from there. Uh, and in general, I have seen, at least in British Columbia, people starting with adopting and then after a couple of semesters of adopting then they start tweaking and adapting and revising perhaps even remixing so even though we talk about the 5R permissions as a wonderful uh, feature of, of OER as a defining feature of OER of course um, uh, it's typically it's one of those things that it's nice to have but you're not really going to use it in practice most people I don't see using those uh, those permissions immediately uh, until they uh, are comfortable so What's planned right now is uh, is beyond the interview studies uh, with the faculty users. I'm also really interested. Um, this is sort of a different way of getting at the same uh, question. Is an online survey we're going to launch in the fall with faculty non-users, so people who explicitly do not use OER, who are not interested in adopting OER. And I really, really want to talk to them, get a sense of why. Uh, and I don't just mean this in, in a judgmental. You should be doing this, but I'm really interested in in what are the specific reasons. Uh, and so I've got a link over here. I don't know if you can click on this. Um, if you can't, I'm going to see if I can actually paste this link in the um, chat window, but it actually takes you to an online um, preview of the survey. Um, there we go. There we go. Um, uh, so please do take a look. Uh, it's open for feedback. It is not open for uh, for research right now. So we're, we're just beginning the ethics process for this. Um, so we're not collecting data, as it were, but we're happy to, I'm happy to take your feedback. Um, uh, and so um, I'll give you a, just a few seconds to, to click on that if you want to if you want to navigate to that. Um, but if you click on that link, it'll give you a much better impression than than some, sort of the raw questions without the response options that I'm about to bring up. But some questions that I'm trying to address over there are things like this. So who has a role at your institution in selecting these educational resources? Is it you? Is it a committee in your department? Is it the entire department? Is it administration? Is it an instructional design team? Because this is often a big uh, barrier, not, not uh, in the majority of cases, but trying to get a sense of uh, how big of an issue this is. Um, when selecting a required textbook, how important are many of the following factors to you? Uh, and when I'm talking about factors, I'm, I'm talking about cost, reputation of authors, quality of ancillary resources, comprehensiveness of coverage, the fact that uh, it's recently updated, as somebody pointed out a minute ago, which can be important in some disciplines, is the fact that it hasn't been updated recently a significant barrier for you. Um, that it's been used or recommended by other faculty that you know, the quality of the writing, theoretical orientation, the fact that it's a, a um, uh, Canadian, which sometimes for people is, is a big deal, um, uh, which is an interesting uh, question. Ease of fit with current teaching materials, um, and then and then more interesting questions about the relationship with the publisher's representative, um, the sponsorships or other financial incentives um, are offered by the publisher. And even though that sounds really ridiculous, that's that's actually often the case, at least in our educational context. Uh, it is not unheard of for departments to receive dollar value kickbacks for every textbook that students adopt within a department over a three-year adoption cycle, for example. Um, nice and nice, uh, nice. Uh, and study about ethics. Um, uh, other questions that we're asking: Do you teach at least one course without a formal textbook? Trying to get a sense of, you know, how um, how 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 uh, how comfortable are they operating without a without a traditional textbook? Do they already teach courses, perhaps upper level courses, with readings and assembled resources um, to get a sense of is that is uh, is that a potential gateway, for example? Um, 
uh, on, on the flip side, uh, do you ever require your students to purchase an access code for one of these online resources? Uh, I often refer to these, these online resources, these online, online homework solutions, uh, adaptive quizzing, whatever you call, whatever the specific resource is. Um, in my experience, those are the sort of gateway drugs that faculty get hooked onto. It's not a particular textbook. It's not usually the particular author or publisher, but they believe and this is a huge assumption that these online resources um, uh, deliver a positive impact on their students' learning outcomes. Um, and that belief is what uh, is what holds them to the textbook. Um, of course, it's interesting that I think over the last week, in fact, there was a study that was that looked at adaptive quizzing in the United States on a massive scale that found really no major impact. Um, but I mean, this is something that could lock them in and this could be the deal breaker. And this in turn could suggest to OER producers like OpenStax and BC Campus, the need to develop those platforms because the textbook can be as grand as they are, as high quality as they are. But if this is missing, if this is a deal breaker, you're, you are only going to be preaching to the choir at that point. A um, couple of other uh, slides with questions, very quick. How often per semester do you receive inquiries or queries from students about whether they really need the open text, uh, whether they really need the course textbook? This is usually how uh, I think the, the way in which instructors um, get any sense of the impact of textbook costs on their students is those emails. Do I really need the book? How often do you receive those emails? How often do you, re do you receive emails asking whether the students can use an older or earlier edition of the book? Um, uh, and then finally, we're trying to ask uh, instructors about uh, if they had to guess uh, what percentage do you think are not purchasing the required course textbook um, and how confident are you in that estimate? Because uh, I'm really interested. I, I do think we're dealing with a, 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 a prototypical, uh, perhaps a, a textbook case, I'm being cute here, uh, of a principal agent dilemma. Um, because when an individual makes a decision that a large group of people are bound by, but they themselves never have to face the consequences of that decision, like assigning a high cost textbook for students when they don't have to buy it themselves, I think that creates a, a real uh, separation, a separation that, that has the potential um, uh, to lead to uh, assumptions that everyone has the book, that um, the high cost is not bothering the students. And so I want to measure that and then speak to the gap, perhaps, between what students are actually doing and what instructors who are not adopting open textbooks think that they are doing. Last slide here. Um, uh, of course, we wanted to ask them right at the end about OER as well. Are they aware of this at all? Uh, and then, of course, ask about a, a series of potential uh, deterrents uh, to uh, using um, OER. Um, uh, things like, uh, well, these are some of the things that were reflected in the earlier study, actually. Things like difficult to locate, not available ancillary resources, not up to date, not relevant to my local context, lack of support from department, institution, um, uh, not used by people I know, or, or generally lower quality. So, um, yes, I'm just looking at Jinov's question. There's adopting and then beginning point after understanding. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, I think it's it's so remarkable um, with o, with OER. I, I, people use the term, and I've been using the term as well, uh, gateway in terms of in a, you know the open movement or the o, open water. Um, but I think it's incredible how many entry points there are. Um, in some cases, I see um, that it is supplementary resources to the principal textbook. In some cases, I see that it's one course that uh, spirals into other courses and then they become through and through open across their courses. In some cases, I see it's an individual within a department that then bleeds into the entire department, for example. Uh, it, it's quite fascinating. In some cases, it's from uh, OER to open pedagogy. In some cases, it's open pedagogy to OER. <laughs> so I, I think it's really quite interesting. Um, but certainly for students and certainly at, at the kinds of institutions that I work at, uh, access and accessibility both uh, in terms of being compatible with, let's say, assistive learning technologies are certainly a key issue. So um, I've taken almost 55 minutes, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm very, very happy to, to continue chatting. Um, and I would love, as I said, to receive your questions, your comments. And if you're interested in collaborating in any way, um, I'm um, starting to work with colleagues outside of British Columbia, in, outside of BC in many contexts, um, to look at some of these similar issues. But even if you just want some of the instruments I'm using, like the TAUS or anything else, please, please shoot me an email, tweet me, um, and I will slowly respond to you.
Thank you. And and just for Jenny, um, I'm glad that you're going to be in Ontario. Um, there's so much work happening in Ontario right now at Carlton and Ryerson and Sheridan and, and McMaster and Waterloo. Um, I'm optimistic that we can actually hold an, an OER. Thank you for the comment, um, Caroline. Um, yeah, I, I think it'd be it'd be really interesting to hear as well. I mean, uh, I think the, the the context, especially the national context, uh, and uh, can make a huge difference. In some cases, uh, tuition and textbooks are not an issue at all, and, and so really the the question is not so much about access and accessibility. It's much more about the pedagogy. Oh, great! I'm glad to hear you're in BC, Janet. I've just re been responding by talking, but can you guys hear me? Oh, good. Yeah, please go ahead, Rob. Uh, no, it's a good question. Uh, the TAUS is just a textbook assessment and usage scale. It was actually developed for uh, 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 originally for, for traditional textbooks. I just saw no reason why we couldn't apply the same questions to the open textbooks. Um, so uh, I can, um, if you if you send me an email, I can make that available to you. But even if you Google textbook assessment and usage scale or TAUS and the journal name teaching of psychology, uh, I don't doubt that you'll, you'll find it. Um, it is paywalled of course, uh, but I can send you a copy. Ah, uh, gosh. Uh, I don't know if I would say I have a lot of experience with survey research. Uh, so OER is the main place where I've been doing survey research. Usually I do more experimental research or other kinds. Um, but you know, I think uh, it's a it's a learning curve. I think part of it is the importance of pilot testing, um, uh, the importance of thinking about the length of the survey, uh, dropout rate. What questions do you really need to ask versus what would be just nice to ask, um, and sort of balance that. Uh, also, um, uh, I think being very careful about things like um, the specific kind of Likert scales that you're using, um, uh, whether they have a neutral point or not, uh, whether you are allowing for open-ended responses to for, for people to elaborate or not. Um, but I think with sampling, uh, with with surveys, sampling is always a key issue, and and trying to obtain a sample that's reasonably representative, um, it's very difficult with this kind of a, with this kind of research. Uh, you know, who are we trying to um, uh, sample from? What's our sampling frame? Um, and I think with OER research, there's such little awareness of OER, with more than 60% of faculty sort of looking at you quizzically when you say the term OER, uh, that you have to be very careful. Um, in terms of where you're sampling from, um, depending on your, your question. So if I'm interested in non-users, that's going to be a very different way of sampling than, than if I'm interested in people who are adopting. Um, and, and 
So I think it, there's methodological issues with all of this, but I'm still learning. Um, Igor, um, thank you. Uh, um, so I mean, open pedagogy and o OE practice, I mean, I, 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 this is a really good question and I'm not sure I'm, I'm an authority over here, but um, for me, open practices is, is the broadest term, uh, much more so than OER or open pedagogy. Um, I see most people when they talk about open pedagogy point to a particular blog post by David Wiley several years ago in which he talks principally about the design and uh, of so-called non-disposable assignments. Uh, so instead of asking students to, to, let's say, write a research essay that will only be read by one person, the instructor, and then uh, will likely, uh, the instructor's feedback will likely not even be read by the individual student. Um, having students, you know, harnessing their potential energy, creativity to create resources for the commons. So I see open pedagogy used very much in that context, but it's also, you know, much more creatively if you look at some of the work of people like Robin DeRosa uh, using social annotation within open textbooks over the course of a semester as another form of, so I see people sort of bringing uh, the notion of public scholarship by students and open pedagogy and non-disposable assignments sort of together. And that's where I see the, the where the question of open pedagogy lies right now. Uh, but OE practice could be much broader, it could be the open pedagogy, as I just said, it could be the uh, adoption, adaptation, revision, remixing of OER creation. Uh, it could be, let's say, open course development, even as as the Open Educational Resources University TAS, the OERU, is doing right now uh, with the radical transparency in terms of de uh, designing and, and rev revising courses openly with every decision openly on the web. Um, it could be open and flexible learning pathways. Um, so OE practice, I think, is very broad, and if you expand it to include not just open educational practice, but open practices more broadly, then you're talking about everything, right? You're talking about um, open data, open science practices, um, um, open research materials, um, open access publishing. So thank you, and thank you for sharing those links, uh, Ginoff and Jennifer. Yeah, but again, I'm not really an authority over here, um, but it's just the more I work in this space, the more uh, I see the parallels between all of these movements, open access, open data, uh, OER. And so I see it much more and more as a deeper philosophy that that embeds what we do. Uh, and if you start to follow those principles, start to um, uh, do work that reflects your value hierarchy, you start to practice openly in, in all facets. Yeah. Yeah, and there was an article about 100 Shades of Openness as well, which is interesting. Um, do universities see MOOCs as a large future present potential source of revenue? Um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I think they do, but I confess I don't have a very um, uh, lofty opinion of MOOCs. Uh, I think they're an abjectly impoverished version of what open education could be. Uh, I think they're embedded with a series of assumptions that are ridiculous, uh, but uh, that may be a discussion for another time. Um, so feel free to, uh, to to send me an email about that. Um, and really, for all of you, I apologize for taking so long, uh, but I would love to hear your questions, your comments on any on any of the research. And thank you again, Rob and Beck.